Hey, everybody, this is Alan Gratzer of REO Speedwagon, and you're listening to Homegrown KIO on Classic Hits 107.9 WKIO. I am L.A. Fredrickson. And I'm Dave Leak. And we are the co-hosts for Homegrown KIO, and we are very pleased to welcome to our show the very fine drummer, one of my heroes, and founding member of REO Speedwagon, Alan Gratzer. Alan, thank you for joining us. Hey. It's a real honor to talk with you. How you doing? I'm doing great. Good to be here. Well, this is a real treat. Dave's, uh, I could say all kinds of things about how excited you were. I like oh, you yeah. Know, you wet, wet, your, wet your pants. I think we'll take that out. Yeah, no, that, <laughs> yeah, yeah let's no. not get too crazy. <laughs> but but yeah, anyway, no. um, there's some history with this band. You know, one of the, thing, the coolest things about this is that Neil and Alan were in um, Illinois Street Residence Halls, mm -hmm. and somewhere along the line, someone got the idea that they ought to put little brass nameplates on the doors of people that lived there at one time or another. And Alan's got his name on there. All Neil's, right. Isn't that cool? I lived in Florida Avenue, so I'm not sure if those were built at the time. but No, Florida Avenue was there. In fact, we used to go down in the steam tunnels from uh, ISR at underground all the way to Florida Avenue. They had a <laughs> piano in the basement. And N Neil had never been in a band before, but he goes, well, I could play keyboards. And I said, well, okay. So we ended up going down there. You know, every few nights we'd go down and, and just uh, watch Neil play piano and sing along and, and, you know, pop up out of the sidewalk in front of uh, Florida <laughs> Avenue. <laughs> Luckily, we never got caught. I but, love uh, that. Yeah. I, that's good. I didn't know that part of the story. I knew that he oh, went yeah. home over the summer and learned note for note the entire solo to uh, light my fire. I said... Neil, just go home. Let's start out. Just learn. Well, let's learn all the songs on the first Doors album. And uh, and he came back, and lo and behold, you know, I had to play every drum lick exactly like the eight minutes of the song was because he's playing <laughs> every note. We heard the Doors live and thought, wait a minute, they're not so good. They can't do this. They're not hitting it. <laughs> 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 Magic of like, production, yeah. right? Great story. Yeah, yeah it is. Yeah. No kidding. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway. <laughs> Um, let's see, 1989, this is my first question to you. In 1989, after taking REO to the top of the charts and unimaginable success, no doubt about that, you decided to leave the group. That must have been a soul-searching, difficult kind of decision. A few years ago, we uh, talked with Bruce and Neil from REO, and Neil made the comment that there was always something better coming up in REO's future, uh, which was an interesting comment. It's one of the reasons why you guys stuck with it so long. But I suppose once you've achieved the success that you had with High Infidelity and all of that, was that one of the reasons you wanted to walk away at the top of your game, so to speak? Well... Nah, not really, because I still enjoyed the two hours on stage and playing and, uh, you know, being around the guys. It's a, you know, a real, like you're in a state of arrested adolescence, basically, in a <laughs> club of uh, <laughs> men, quote, mm -hmm. act like kids, you know. So, yeah, no, that part was fine. But at that point in my life, I had, uh, you know, a wife. I had three kids. We were either in the studio or on the road, you know, 90% of the time. And I realized... Uh, I just wasn't being a real dad. You know, I, I yeah. was gone so much. My wife, you know, had her own career in L when we lived in L.A. And, uh, you know, we could obviously afford to have someone help us take care of the kids and stuff. But I just, you know, it was an easy decision. The last couple of years I was in the band, I was pretty miserable, to be honest. Uh, hmm. You know, we'd be on the bus and uh, I'd be just kind of grumpy. I mean, I'd get all happy when it was time to go play. but. Yeah. You know, you got to kill the other 22 hours out of the day. And, uh, you know, I was missing being home, basically. So, and, you know, I, I just did uh, 21 years. I thought, wait a minute, this is long enough to run its course for me. And, you know, I still have I left on great terms. Still am on great terms with everybody in the band. That's cool. Uh, but it was a pretty easy decision. I have no regrets. I knew it was really hard on Gary, wasn't it? I mean, he got kind of emotional about that because you guys were. Yeah, yeah. It, Gary, uh, you know, we had a meeting at John Barrick's house, and, you know, it was basically to tell everybody I was leaving the band. No one knew that hmm. at the time. But uh, I went over there and, you know, dropped the bomb on everybody, and I just looked around and, I realized that, guys, haven't you noticed how grumpy I've been the last couple mm, of years? Yeah. Not a happy camper so much, but Gary took it the hardest. He, he, uh, 
uh, we went outside afterward, and, uh, you know, I mean, he was just pretty distraught because I was kind of always, the, in a way, the mediator between Gary and Kevin. You know, they yeah. were butt heads, and there yeah. I was uh, trying to keep the peace and, you know, be on both sides of the fence at the same time, and uh, and I wasn't going to be there anymore. So, mm. boy, he gave me a big hug outside afterward, and he just was bawling like a baby oh, for about a minute. You know, I just felt... Gary, I'm just I'm so sorry, but my family at this point is more important to me than being in a band. So uh, yeah, it was hard for Gary, and lo and behold, a year later, uh, he and Kevin ended up uh, yeah going yeah. going their separate ways. Well, along those lines, Gary, um, I think you probably knew he was an important mentor to uh, Ginger, the band I was in. We opened for you yeah. guys a few times. You kind of took yeah. us under the wing, uh-huh. but him in particular took us under the wing, played on some recordings and stuff, did some recording over at uh, Golden Voice. And, uh, I mean, in, immense, you know, stuff we learned in a short amount of time. He told us once, you don't have to listen to me, but it took me a lot of years to figure this out. And uh, we said, there's no reason to take a lot of years to figure it out if you're going to tell us. So, uh, yeah. But, uh, you know, it must have been difficult to watch him after the fact, maybe, you um, uh, after you left to kind of lose control of himself there. I know I miss him. It must have been doubly hard for you. Yeah, it, it was real hard. And I, I was on the phone with his wife all the time just to figure out what could be done. It got to the point where he didn't want to talk to me hardly anymore. This is all after he left the band. Mm. Uh, I just said, Gary, I, I said, you got to get your act together. You know, you, you can't keep on the course you're on. Yeah. You know, he was just drinking way too much. And, couldn't stop you know he just uh, has a very addictive personality and it got to the point where he couldn't couldn't give it up so, that's unfortunate I, man that's I, really... thought I was the only one in the band that was in touch with him I kept oh, asking right? him and he said no oh, yeah yeah Alan you look back at those videos I'm sorry I'm kind of rambling on here but man was he, no, a, no, no, he was a spark for that band they really you know oh are you kidding oh unbelievable oh, no, he was our Stud. He was our rock in the early days. He was a, you know, he kind of personified rock and roll. You know, he's just a great guitar player and looked great on stage and yeah. had the whole physical package. And, yeah, he did. Uh, great songwriter, to too. Around. Yeah, great yeah, songwriter. Great song yeah. Yep. Oh, well, um, uh, jumping ahead a little bit here before Dave's got a question. I know he's got a number of them here, but uh, one of the songs we're going to feature on a 60s show coming up here is uh, when Scorfino was in the band. I've gotten to know him uh, <laughs> recently. And uh, when you guys did that thing in front of uh, Daily Plaza, remember that, that with uh, when oh, Latrell was sure. in the band? And uh, and, we're, and yeah. Sweet Lucille, is that what we're going to play? Yep. Yeah, we got Sweet Lucille. we got Sweet Lucille, so we're going to feature that as an early uh, REO 60s song. Uh, wow, I, didn't, yeah, I had no idea that that was even uh, recorded. Yeah, <laughs> it's awesome. And, there, and there's, uh, oh, what was that guy's name? Uh, I'm spacing on the guy that took... Uh, all the photographs of bands back then, but uh, oh, Arnie White, yes, Arnie. that's it, yeah. yeah Arnie, and he yeah, had a bunch of stills. Um, he was on the stage for that, and there were a ton of people out there. That was a that was the biggest crowd at the time. You know, we didn't have a record deal then or anything because it was in the late '60s, and uh, the biggest crowd we've ever played in front of in the middle of downtown Chicago. And also that night, we opened at a club for Rod Stewart, and Rod Stewart, you know, it was like the one of the first times he had been coming to america i think so he wasn't that big as he was playing the club and we'd open for him but we knew about him wow and then that night this was you know we played in the afternoon outside in front of i don't know 10 15 000 people then uh open for rod stewart and then that night we went to the playboy man we got invited to the playboy <laughs> wow and of course we we went you know but we're going through the door or the entrance you know and there were back then they were called women livers you know which was you right know, Right. At this point, we have respect for them, but at the time, they're going, "Don't go!" Oh, no, don't go. Oh, no. We looked at each other, and went, "Oh, we're going." What so you, yeah, you had to fight your way through them to get inside. <laughs> well, we didn't fight our way through, but yeah. they were all chanting that, you know. I, yeah. I was laughing. One last thing about that particular gig, Terry uh, was in tons of fun band for quite a while, and he was talking about doing that show, and the Black Panther showed up. And the police were getting really nervous about that because he thought there was something was going to happen. And Terry, yeah. being naive, um, I guess, to the situation, said, hey, the Black Panthers are here. Come on up here and play percussion with us. <laughs> on, on sympathy for the devil. 
<laughs> yeah, no, good stuff. I, I love the early things. And All right, last one, and then Dave, you're up. But I remember he's seeing on, you he's guys. He's on a roll. Yeah, I'm on a roll. I saw you guys, like 71 on the quad. You were like uh, right yeah. in front of the Alana Union facing south towards the auditorium there, and you yep. we were doing uh, Gypsy Woman's Passion, and I was just like, these guys are on fire. They're so exciting. I don't know if you think about yeah, that stuff anymore. But. Back then, and I wish I had recorded because the first, you know, we played the brown jug all the time when we first formed in the fall of 67, and I sang at least half the songs, and I would go out in front and play bass. Neil would go to the back and play drums. <laughs> Because it looked kind of silly to have the drummer singing every song from the back. So I, okay, I'll just go out and play bass. You know, but we were just a cover band. We're playing Hendrix and wow. Beatles songs and, you know, Stone songs and whatever. Doors, mostly doors. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Anyway. Cool. Yeah. I didn't know that. That's really cool. I wish there yeah, were recordings well, I of that. Yeah, had a recording of it. There are absolutely zero recordings that anybody has. Dave, you got any questions? <laughs> well, I was going to ask that uh, you must have numerous favorite memories, but uh, if you could just talk about a few, specifically maybe playing in Live Aid, and then mm, also something yeah. I'm interested in, because when I found out that Brian May – was recording an album with Eddie Van Halen. I actually went out and bought it. I actually have it here at the. Uh, I have it here at the radio station as we speak. That's a rare copy. And uh, yeah, I got a, the vinyl LP, and I looked on the back, and hey, Alan Grantzer's playing drums on this. <laughs> right. This is really awesome. Yeah. So any any well, memories uh, of either Live Aid or maybe doing oh, that Starfleet sure, got, album? Yeah, I'll tell you about both of those uh, incidences. Uh, first of all. When we played Live Aid, we played, you know, that afternoon, our our set was maybe, I don't know, 1 o'clock in the afternoon. We had a gig that night in Milwaukee, so we had to play our, what, three songs, I think, that we played. I jumped up on stage for the very first time, saw the drum set right before we had to hit our first note. Wow. Had, you know, no sound check, no nothing. So we played Roll With The Changes first, and Kevin starts out playing piano, he started playing, and I couldn't hear a note he's playing. Wow. I have to do all these accents to get the song going, and I'm just going, oh, this is ridiculous. But oh, So man. I don't know this way, to be honest. Uh, you know, I'm playing drums with the cymbals are about four feet over my head. I'm going, <laughs> way up here, you know, I'm going, it was very strange. But anyway, it was a lot of fun. Uh, I remember my wife and kids were there, and they're singing background. Mm. Uh, we had the, in the video, you could see my wife holding our, who now, uh, my daughter, who's I think 39, mm. uh, is mm. expecting her second child uh, in April, next uh, this coming month, holding her, you know, I mean, that's how long ago that wow. was, she was, maybe two or two or three years old, looking out at this crowd of, I don't know, 80,000 people or whatever it was. But anyway, so that was a lot of fun. And then we got on our plane, went to, uh, we couldn't, the weather was so bad in Milwaukee that we couldn't land in Milwaukee. So we had to land in Chicago, take the bus, Take you know, rented a bus, went up, uh, drove up to Milwaukee, you know, but the whole time I just remember it was thundering and lightning the whole time. All the kids were looking out the window going, Oh dad, look at that. You know, it was very wow. exciting. Scary so stuff. That was a very long day. A very long and uh, exciting day, I do remember. Um anyway, mm. uh, Brian May lived about a block away from me in LA. Huh. And one day one day we're at the I uh, you know, the, this little we lived in Hancock Park. Uh, a section of Los Angeles, you know, kind of big houses on small lots. But, uh, and I, you know, at the Halloween parade going down our little business street, I see this head going up, it's about a foot tall and everybody else walking. And it's, <laughs> I'm going, God, that looks like Brian May. So, I, you know, he walks by. And so after the parade, I walk up and introduce myself and we became fast friends. You know, mm. you know, he came over to eat a bunch of times and with his family and, uh, but anyway, one day Brian called me and said, uh, you know, he's the most gentle man in the world, you know, uh, Alan would, would like to come over and, uh, uh, you know, uh, play, we're going to go into the record plant for a couple of days and, uh, just roll tape and, uh, I've got to do a song, you know, his son, Jimmy, uh, it was, it was kind of this, um, a kid's song from a kid's TV show in England. Hmm. Uh, and we're just going to rock it up. It's called Starfleet. Uh, but I said, oh, sure, I'll come in. We'll just, uh, it'll be fun. And I thought, oh, this is going to be great. I'll get to play with Brian May. You know, right. I, just, you know, we, I, I know him personally, but we never did anything musically. So mm. we went in, and I said, who else is coming? He goes, well, uh, Eddie's coming. And uh, you know, Fred Mandel from Rod Stewart's band. And I said, well, Eddie is in Eddie Van Halen? He goes, yes. So, <laughs> I, you know, we rolled tape for two days, and I'm sitting there playing my drums. 
And on one side in front and one side, you know, left side, right side, both in a little bit in front of me, Eddie on one side, Brian on the other. And I thought I died and went to heaven. You know? <laughs> it's like, a long ways from the steam tunnels at the U of I. Yeah, very a long way from the steam tunnels. So it was uh, so it was great. You know, I don't think that the you know we didn't play that well. To be honest, oh, I don't know you about know, that. No real major rehearsing or anything. We just kind of were having fun, and it was never supposed to be released at all. Huh? And then one day, Brian Brian called. He says Capital wants to release it. Here's a check for thirty grand. I went. Well, okay, they could release it. <laughs> so for nothing, you know, I you know we just kind of went in for a couple of days and had fun, and uh, and there was another song called "Let Me Out" that. Uh, brian had written uh and he said freddie will never let me do this so you know <laughs> let's just do it now uh and other than that it was a lot of blues jamming and uh i, I was going to ask about that. the whole second side of that was just called blues breakers was that just somebody started rolling yeah. and you guys just start jamming we just were rolling along having fun you know no one planned anything we were just playing and uh you know, Eddie, at the end of that, he had broken at least one string. So, you know, <laughs> and it was so out of tune that by the end, that, you know, they, it was Brian and Eddie kind of competing with each other, but it was wild to listen to. Yeah. It, it's yeah, that fun, was a lot of fun. fun to listen to with headphones because you figure, okay, that you could pick out who was doing which solo. Like, okay, that's Eddie, yeah. and oh, that's Brian. I know. Oh, so cool. Brian, Brian has a very distinctive tone, you know. He yeah. plays with that little English coin, the little tuppence, you know, that he plays with. Uh, mm. Yeah, and his guitar is homemade, you know. He's yeah. He's a guitar. So, I didn't know um, that. Great yeah, story. very cool. Well, I do have a copy yeah, of and the vinyl I album. I looked for that ah, online. Yeah, you can't <laughs> find it, you know. And, and if yeah. you do, it's like, you know, 100 bucks or something, you know, so. Yeah, hold on to that. <laughs> put it on the wall. Put, put it on eBay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, it's not going on eBay. Oral, orally, it's not that you know great, but you know, but we had fun, and there's a few. Yeah, high, high that's so cool. Such a cool I'm story. I'm just smiling the whole time. I'm just laughing. I think, boy, this is so fun. No. I bet you. <laughs> yeah. I um, I've got one quick question about your playing. I mean, I've always enjoyed and admired the way you played. It was so much energy. But uh, one song in particular was uh, "Don't Let Him Go." I loved the way you played that. It just uh, really oh, kicked the song along. It's funny because seven of the ten tracks on Heinz Veldi were demo tracks that we you know we always went into a little funk. We'd find a funky studio in L.A. and just go in and. All the songs that we thought could maybe be on the record, we did maybe one or two takes just to, so we could listen to them uh, and see how they sounded. But we ended up keeping on High Fidelity, our you know biggest selling record. Uh, yeah. Seven of the ten were just demo tracks. Wow! So we, we tried to make them better, and we couldn't. So wow! I think we, we ended up putting a little too much reverb on stuff, but uh, that was. You know, did you know that you had something special with that album? I don't. You know, at the time. You know, there was our uh, 10th or 11th album, I can't remember which, but uh, we just thought we were making another record, you know, but mm -hmm. we had a couple of ballads this time, you know, Gary wrote Take It On The Run, and mm -hmm. I'll Keep On Loving You, and it was like, okay, you know, these are kind of a break from what we normally do, uh, so I guess people liked that, or at least, you know, some people didn't, there were hardcore REO fans that thought we'd sold out but we weren't trying to sell out or i say we were just kind of you know you evolve as a band at yeah. that point we've been together for you know 10 or 12 years or whatever and uh you know it was just growing up and moving along and trying something different somewhere along the line you got major producing chops and it was you and uh and kevin that did a lot of that and where how'd that come about well uh, gary we we made our live album um uh, uh gary got credit for uh production just because you know and we had been produced by other people up until that point and you know when we kind of went through a four or five different producers and never were totally happy with any one of them so we just thought wait a minute we've been doing this we know how we should sound let's just produce ourselves and uh so after the live album Gary and Kevin kind of took over, and then, you know, I was the one non-songwriter in the band, and I thought, wait a minute, I've got to get involved. So uh, hmm. I ended up getting, getting involved in production. And then, you know, Gary, to be honest, toward the end, the last, you know, two or three albums, was a little bit out of it. Hmm. So it was basically Kevin and I. And, you know, Gary would always show up late and, you know, didn't have much to say, to be honest. So, hmm. uh, 
And then toward the very end, uh, you know, Kevin <laughs> really wanted to do everything himself. So mm-hmm. I got very frustrated, and that was about the time I was getting ready to leave. So it made the decision a little bit easier, too. So, well, well props, uh, props to you because it's not easy to do. Uh, Dave and I were talking about it. Dave plays guitar, and he's. Uh, I try to. Yeah, he's learning how to do that and play some <laughs> church band and all that and uh, doing the headphones and. Good stuff, but uh, we both know that uh, you can get out of control really fast when you're trying to produce something. You know, you get a little bit more of this, a little bit more of that, a little bit more of that, and next thing you know, you got to start all over again. So, well, yeah, that's just it. And we had we had two 24 tracks synced together, so we had 48 tracks. Wow! And I just I kept telling Kevin, I said, look, we don't have to fill all of these, and you know, and the mantra, my mantra, was always less is more. You know, I listened yeah. to early albums like By the Who or whatever. Uh-huh. And you could pick out every instrument. You know, yeah. uh, the ones that sound good, the records that sound good, you can hear every instrument that's on the road. When you put too much stuff on, everything just kind of gets lost. It sounds like Phil Spector or something. You know, and just uh, <laughs> yeah. the wall so of sound. I kept saying less is more. And Kevin, at one point, I don't know, probably ten years ago, after I've been out of the band for a long time, he goes, you know. You were right all those years, you know, and I said, I said, what are you talking about? He goes, well, about less is more. I went, well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, you listen to Bad Company or Free, and I was like, man, yeah. great songs. You got to play the holes sometime, you know? Yeah, no, it's rock and roll. There's got to be some space in there. Yeah. All right, Dave. Yeah, I was just going to ask, since I, I'm a big kind of history buff, just going uh, going back to the beginning, just if you could comment just on the music scene. I mean, we we know that... The Red Lion Inn and REO Speedwagon go hand in hand, but just, uh, you know, who else was playing in town? And, and did you have any, like, rivals at the time? Or uh, besides Red Lion, any other, you mentioned Brown Jug already, any other great places to play? Yeah, no, uh, you know, we, you know, Red Lion was kind of our, when we played in Champaign, it evolved into that's where we always ended up playing. And, you know, and look back in retrospect, I remember there were 700 people in there toward the end when it got to the point where it was too dangerous to play because there wasn't even a rear door in that place. You came to the front little narrow door, the band, the, the, you know, the stage was way in the back. And I thought, you know, and people were literally up in the rafters and stuff, just hanging out, uh, you know, watching. And I kept looking around going, man, if there was a fire in here. Yeah. Yeah. Well, what was the fire? Fire code was what three hundred fifty or something. You probably doubled. I have no idea, but I know that there were seven hundred people who were holding. Oh my gosh! Oh my god! Yeah, they were crammed. And I don't know if you know it, but the place is reopened. They they don't do. I've heard. Yeah, yeah, that's cool. They don't have bands, which is unfortunate, but uh, it actually has reopened in the same building. Yep, and it's called the Red Line. Yeah, yeah, I had heard rumors, and I know there were some reunion uh, things that have happened that I didn't go to but uh, yeah, yeah. I, was, I was actively involved in both of those and we ended up raising you get a kick out of this we raised like a between the two of them somewhere between thirty five and forty thousand dollars and we gave all the money to um, high schools and junior high music programs in champaign or band uh, very cool yeah that's awesome oh, great yeah, it was very right. cool. Next time I'll show up then, okay. <laughs> I don't know. Well, you can be in charge of that one, Alan. They're a lot of work. <laughs> yeah. You still keep contact with anybody in the band? No, oh, I still, I you know, I've got a thread with uh, with Neil and Bruce and Kevin, uh, and Tom, our manager, too, is on it, that, uh, yeah, we are we correspond every couple of weeks. I'll, you know, send a text out or some video or something that's going on and uh, you know they will do the same kevin's writing a book so yeah uh, i'm anxious so to see that i've been in contact with him for a while and you know we have emailed some serious emails and you know we both got some stuff off of our chest which is actually kind of great yeah no he goes, doubt well, don't worry you get your own chapter which you know i'm scares me a little because who knows <laughs> <laughs> yeah right I, I, alan i know we have to wrap things up but i, I do want to tell you that i was in the dorms in uh in Florida Avenue in 1979, and one of the things we did to try to get to the Pennsylvania Avenue dorms across the way is we all uh, turned our speakers of our stereos out the window 
all, you know, like everybody on seventh floor of FAR, and uh, somebody in the hallway went three, two, one now, and we all played on our turntables riding the storm out at the exact <laughs> oh, no. same time at full volume with all of our speakers pointed out the window at PAR. Drop the needle. Yeah. Very nice. So, Very nice. That's good, Dave. You know, I, uh, I actually, no, I was in Champaign, I don't know, we were, my wife and I went to see some friends about uh, three or four years ago. Anyway, uh, I thought, okay, I'm going to go over to the dorm, and you know, we were just walking around and see if I can get in. But it, there's so much security now that oh, yeah. unless you're a actual live in the dorm, you've got to get a key to get in. So I just kind of loitered around the door while you know students are going in and out. When the door opened at one point, you know they saw this old old guy hanging out. That's a good visual. I, I snuck in, <laughs> went up to the second floor, and walked down to where our rooms were, and there were the plaques on the wow. door. Wow. Know, you know, this room was formerly the room of Alan Gratz or whatever of Arias. Ah, oh, man, that had Neil to be. Had his own too. Congratulations! Seriously, you know, you know how hard it is to make it in this business, and to, I know. Uh, I feel very by the way, the uh, Abraham Lincoln Library in Springfield had a, a really cool, what would you call it, Dave? Um, Exhibition. Exhibit. It, yeah, called the State of Sound. And it was all about Illinois uh, people. Great big old picture of Gary and uh, and Kevin on the front of this thing before you even go in, in the building. But they also had uh, the what, the diamond or the platinum. What's the one for you get 10 million uh, sales? That's the diamond. Diamond. Yeah, we they got had, that a couple years ago. Yeah, they yeah. had that, they had that, uh, that uh, award on, on display in there. So, oh, geez, nice. how about that? <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's well, it was stuck at about uh, you know 9.9 .9 million for many, many years, and then all of a sudden streaming came along, and yeah. every 15, 1,500 streams counts for one record sale. So, you know, wow, do the wow. Math. I didn't about know that, streaming. I didn't know that either. Yeah. Wow, uh, and and then the uh, Ozark, right? It played uh, "Time for Me to Fly." Yeah, was a, you know, sure. Series Ozark. We were laundering. They were laundering money. Which, you know, we did that all the time. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, and this is super. Thank you so much yeah. for that. Congrats on a great career, and we appreciate your time today. Well, absolutely, I uh, enjoyed this. Uh, I don't get to do this that often anymore. So, uh, yeah, thank you very much. It was fun. Yeah. How's your golf game, by the way? Yeah, a golf game is, you know, yeah. now that I'm 73, mm, it's mm. not getting better. It's kind of going the other direction. But yeah. I keep buying new equipment thinking that's going to help. <laughs> That'll do no, it. No impact at all. Yeah. yeah. Well, you can have success, major success in one one field, and then you can go out and play golf, right? And that's a yeah. humbling experience. I do, I, and I enjoy it. I enjoy <laughs> playing golf. Yeah, it's a lot of fun. So you're going to uh, tune in sometime. Nice. It's, it's easy to, easy to find. Right, I'll, I'll send you all the I info. Will. I'll do it. Okay, cool. Thank you so much, right. man. Thanks, Alan. Good talking to you guys. All right. All right. Bye-bye. Have a good one. Right. All right. Take care. Bye-bye.